This is the second video in a series. This one looks at the more basic methods that are introduced in section 10.2 of our textbook. Remember that torque is a vector cross product with units of newton meters that defines a twist that will cause an angular acceleration around the vector direction of tau. The full vector form of this has to be used for certain kinds of problems that are involve basically three-dimensional situations that you might encounter in a more advanced class in mechanics. Those are in a separate video. Just to remind you, one of the main properties of this, pro of this kind of operation, when you cross r into f, the resulting vector is perpendicular to both of them. What that means, though, is that if r and f are in the xy plane, then the torque is in the direction k hat, that is in the z direction, perpendicular to x and y. And the positive sense for that is defined by the right-hand rotation in the counterclockwise direction. So that for R and F shown here, the result is plus in the k-hat direction. In that kind of situation where the vectors are in the xy plane, we don't have to use all of the unit vectors. Instead, we can just use a geometrical relationship involving the magnitude of R, the magnitude of F, and the sine of the angle between them. As long as we define the angle correctly, this will also give us both the magnitude and the direction of the torque measured around the k-hat axis, that is, around the z-axis perpendicular to the plane of the forces. You've seen this image in the previous video. Here it's got a more specific technical meaning. We look at the vector r, which goes from the axis of rotation to where the force acts, and we extend that with that green dashed line. The angle from R to F is measured from the green dashed line towards F. If that angle is counterclockwise, then that angle is positive in the usual way in which we define angles from X towards Y. This example from the textbook shows the opposite sort of case. If that angle is measured clockwise from the extension of R, then that is a negative torque. That is, the torque points in the negative Z direction. I've got two examples here. One is a fairly straightforward, simple example from chapter 10. The other is a very complicated example from chapter 12. We'll look at both of these at some point in this course. So the first one is on page 159. You might want to pause the video for a second and go and look that up in your textbook. This is a wrench removing a nut from a wheel. The R axis of rotation is through the nut. It's sort of hidden in this picture because I wanted to put a color-coded symbol over there. The vector R points to where the force acts. If you extend the vector R to the green dashed line, then the angle theta that appears in our expression is 113 degrees, measured from that extended line towards F. It's clockwise, so the torque is negative. Now, notice the sine of 113 that shows up in our formula is equal to the sine of 67. So there's a little trick we can use here, and that is we don't actually have to calculate that 113 degree angle. We can use the angle between F and R, that is that smaller angle between the red arrow and the black arrow, because the sine of that angle is equal to the sine of 113. The example from chapter 12 is quite messy because it resembles an actual real physical situation. This is the free body diagram for a lift bridge, a drawbridge, being pulled up by a cable. Again, you might want to pause the video and go to page 187 in your book so you can take a glance at what this situation actually resembles. In this free body diagram, we've got three forces acting on this bridge. One of them acts at the axis of rotation. That makes that part of the problem quite simple. The hinge force there, as it's called in this problem, goes through the axis, so it has zero torque. It has no lever arm, has no torque. This is a really clever trick. If we can put an axis at the location of an unknown force, we can eliminate that unknown force from the problem. This is an incredibly powerful technique that we use over and over and over again in chapter 12. In this case, it just makes sense to have it at that bottom point anyway. Gravity acts downward. The R vector goes from the axis up to where gravity acts. Extending it gives us that green dashed line. And then there's a 120 degree angle from the green dashed line to gravity. That angle is clockwise, so this is a negative torque. Again, notice sine of 120 equals sine of 60 
And we know about the 60 degree angle because it is the other angle in the 30, 60, 90 triangle there that gravity forms with respect to the object. The beam there, that little fake line that's intended to describe that whole drawbridge. So that's also a very clever and useful technique that we can use often in doing problems. The third torque involves this tension force which acts in a particularly complicated way uh, 15 degrees below horizontal. So it actually requires quite a bit of work to go from that vector r, the extended line, the green dashed line there, to figure out that theta 2 is 165 degrees. Notice theta 2 is counterclockwise, so that torque is plus. Now the sine of 165 is equal to the sine of 15. 15 degrees is the angle between the red and the blue arrows where that little orange arrow is appearing. It's not labeled in this picture. It's kind of too bad that it's not labeled in the picture to help make that visible to you. But you could use that angle instead. Again, the angle between R and the force is what shows up in RF sine theta. However, you can't use that angle to tell you the direction of the torque. Only that green arc from R towards F is counterclockwise, telling you that the force produces a counterclockwise torque. Okay, now there's a couple of special cases, really important special cases. We use these as much or more than RF sine theta. First, if the force is parallel to R, so the angle is zero, the torque will be zero. There's an illustration of this in the textbook. If you pull on the handle of a wrench, it's not going to twist the nut. If the angle is plus 90 degrees, then we get a positive counterclockwise torque. If the angle is negative 90 degrees, we get a negative clockwise torque. There's an illustration of this last case in our textbook where if you're pulling on a wrench that way, R cross F is into the paper, that is negative K out direction, and this produces a clockwise negative twist around that nut. Okay, now one of the interesting things is that we can reinterpret RF sine theta a couple of ways that make use of these perpendicular results that we just got. F sine theta is the perpendicular component of F, that is the part of F perpendicular to R. Similarly, R sine theta is the perpendicular part of R. It's the part of R that's perpendicular to F. Let me illustrate those for you. They're in our textbook, but let me illustrate those for you, explain what they mean. The perpendicular component of F shows up if we've got a force acting on a horizontal beam. If we resolve it into its vertical and horizontal components, one of those components will be perpendicular to R and just what we need to calculate the torque. This example from the textbook illustrates that. Force is at an angle, but the wrench is horizontal. So if we break F into its X and Y components, Notice that the Y component is perpendicular to R and it's responsible for the non-zero torque. The parallel part doesn't do anything. So there are many problems where when we automatically decompose a force into its X and Y components, those components can be used in a very simple fashion to calculate the torque from R times F perp. We use this a lot in certain kinds of problems in chapter 12. The other interpretation, R perp, our perp is called the lever arm. It's the leverage of a force acting on something. Here, we, this is how we interpret a force acting tangent to a pulley. Our perp is just the radius of the pulley. Because the force is perpendicular to the radius, that makes the radius our perp. It's also useful if the force is perpendicular to the beam, but the beam itself is not horizontal. We can then interpret a certain dimension as being the lever arm for that force. The picture in the textbook does not do this justice. It's the same problem as before, and it does define what the perpendicular dif distance is. It's sort of like when you do the distance from a point to a line, where the line is now the line of the force, that dashed line extending F. But this is very hard to visualize, quite difficult to calculate. It's not something that you would naturally see in the problem. But if you've got a different problem, one where the force is in a coordinate direction, like horizontal, it is easy to visualize. So instead of looking at that example from the textbook, look at this one where there's, say, a beam that's running diagonally down to the right and a horizontal force pulling on that beam. Now when you extend the line of the force backwards, this is quite clearly a direction that we could see in a normal problem. It's just the perpendicular distance from R to F, from the axis to F. But in this case, 
The angle phi between r and f is also the angle between the green dashed line and r. So r perpendicular is just r sine phi, and we can find that number very easily and use that to do a calculation of the torque. Okay, so again, I'll end with the video frame here showing us where the data and the pictures came from.